If there's any scientists in the audience today, I apologize in advance, but you'll probably have chewed your own fingers off by the time this review is over. That is all. You know, this movie came out in 2003 during the disaster movie craze, which is probably my second least favorite era of cinematic history right behind that time where everyone had this haircut. The core opens with an Indiana Jones-type clearly overqualified college professor whose name I can't actually remember, Jeff or, or, or Josh or something. Through him, we meet the next two team members, an old friend of Jeff slash Josh who's some kind of weapons expert, and a snooty famous physicist who's more interested in his next book deal or government contract than anything else. Anyway, now a bunch of pigeons fly around, smashing into sh**, somehow killing a bunch of people and causing a bus to flip over. Now, apparently the reason for this is that Earth's electromagnetic field is breaking down, and pigeons use that field to navigate by magnetic north. Now, I'm no ornithologist, but uh, don't pigeons have eyes? I mean, pigeons aren't that bright on the best of days, but they don't just fly directly north smacking into everything in front of them. Uh, well, not last time I checked. Next, we take a little hop on up into orbit to meet hyper-competent astronaut lady who's the best at everything ever and should just be flying the shuttle on her own, according to her, but is being kept down by her rude, surly commander who just doesn't want her to outshine him. Actually, that's not really true. They do go somewhere with this, but I'll get there later. Uh, we stick with astronaut people for a couple of minutes while the rest of the plot happens off-screen, so let's talk about this, I guess. These three astronauts are attempting to initiate re-entry to land their shuttle, and Lady Astronaut is all pouty because the commander told her he wasn't going to allow her to land the shuttle because that's his job and not hers. Now, clearly I'm not an astronaut, but I feel like landing a f***ing space shuttle is probably a complex procedure involving a whole bunch of individuals all having to do their jobs with precision, and one mistake could probably kill a lot of people, so it feels like expecting everyone to change up who does what last minute for the sake of your ego is kind of a big ask. Anyway, it hardly matters, since due to a malfunction in the communication system, the shuttle ends up on a collision course with L.A. L.A. But not to worry, Lady Astronaut has a plan that no one else would ever have thought of in a million years. Aim for the one thing that's not usually inhabited in any coastal city. No, not the ocean, you idiot, the river. Yeah, the one with all the aqueducts and bridges running over it. Yeah, that one. F***ing genius, I don't know why anyone else hadn't thought of that. Anyway, they pull it off somehow without anyone getting injured, and everyone goes home happy. Except Lady Astronaut, who continues to pout about everything ever for the rest of the film for no readily apparent reason. I also like how we're supposed to be scared this one random dude might get smeared across a windshield like a turd down a toddler's bedroom wall, but they started off this movie by flipping an entire double-decker bus filled with old people. Choose your stakes and stick to them, the core. Come on now. So, as it turns out, the government is putting this team together because, apparently, the core of the Earth has stopped spinning, causing the electromagnetic sphere to break down. Now, I'm not a physicist, clearly, but if the core stopped spinning, wouldn't it only have stopped spinning relative to us? Meaning, on a planetary scale, it's still spinning pretty fast. And if it stopped relative to space, how, exactly? Because wouldn't the Earth still be spinning around it? So I assume it would probably pick up at least a little momentum from that, right? And if the whole planet stopped spinning, then this movie is over in about five seconds because everyone and everything on it just gets launched right into the f***ing sun. Anyway, this all gets explained to us by way of Josh. <laughs> I remember his name now, it's Josh. Explaining to a room full of people what's going on. He also feels the need to ask specifically for a can of air freshener and then waits for it so that he can give them all this stunning visual aid as if they can't understand words. So from here, we meet our final two members of the crew, a computer hacker who... Oh shit, it's that guy! Hey, remember this guy? Yeah, I bet you do, but I also bet you can't place where you've seen him. I like this guy. But yeah, they recruit him to write a virus to monitor the entire internet for certain keywords so they can keep news of what's happening from getting out. This whole scene is done in that great early 2000s computers are magic and no one knows how they work way that's just so adorably quaint now. We multitask like you breathe. I couldn't think as slow as you if I tried. And lastly, we meet Dr. Brazelton, a.k.a. the best and only reason to watch this movie. He's the guy who builds the tunneling ship to get everyone to the core of the Earth so that they can nuke it and get it spinning again. Uh, no, really, that's their plan. Uh, Brazelton's machine is made of a special alloy he made that gains structural integrity as more pressure is applied to it and converts heat to electricity. He calls it, uh... Unobtainium. If there are any writers in the audience, uh, allow me to speak directly for a moment. Stop calling shit this. It's not cool. It's silly. You're silly. No one has, and no one ever will, take unobtainium seriously. Stop trying to make it happen. 
Anyway, with the stakes set and the team assembled, it's time to start getting ready. I like that they show them training in a simulation and constantly f***ing it up because no one knows what the hell they're doing. I also like that shuttle commander guy tells Lady Astronaut, uh, Beck, that's her name, Beck, that she's too good at everything and that's why she's not ready for a command of her own. He explains to her that she's never lost and so isn't prepared to deal with losing. That's a great lesson in general, and especially a great lesson for just about every writer ever in the last 10 years or so, because characters who win all the time and never have to face that eventual loss are boring. Yeah, I lost my train of thought again. Right, 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 so Brazelton, Josh, Beck, Commander Guy, and the other two finally complete their training and all pile aboard their magic metal cigar to start their journey to the core. To be honest, I'm a little confused why Beck is on this ship. Uh, they say it's because she's a great navigator and orienteer, but that was in space with visible reference points and landmarks. They're digging underground where all you can see in front of you is the next rock. Why do they even need a navigator? They're heading down, it's not like you can miss. Anyway, down they go, and things are going pretty well at first, until they break through this cavern ceiling into a giant geode and their engines get jammed by a crystal. Uh, they have to flush their entrance with liquid nitrogen from their cooling system in order to cool it down enough to leave the ship to cut the crystal out of their engine, because apparently they decided to just not make the entryway part of their conditioned space for some reason? So yeah, they get out and start cutting the crystal, but oh no, lava starts pouring in through the hole they made in the cavern ceiling. Fortunately, they happen to land on this plateau, and the lava somehow isn't pouring right on top of them, and is instead pulling underneath them, giving them time to escape. Unfortunately, Commander Guy gets beamed by a falling rock and dies, so scratch one teammate, I guess. The rest of the crew gets away to continue their journey further down, but whoops, big old diamond ruptures the hull of the ship and weapons expert guy gets crushed to death before the section he's in is jettisoned away. This leads into a little screaming match, and then everyone just sort of gets over it and moves on. Finally, they make it to the core, where they discover that the fluid inside is thinner than they expected, meaning their bombs won't have enough impact to get it spinning again. Now, they bring up that all their calculations were best guesses earlier in the film to account for how this is possible, but you'd think that would cause them to come up with some kind of contingency plan for this. Like, I don't know, bring an extra bomb. Hell, bring two, you're heading down, it's not like weight is an issue. Don't just point out your own plot hole and then not do anything with it. It's also at this point we learn that the reason the core stopped spinning in the first place is that this dude invented some weapon for causing earthquakes or some such. Now apparently their plan B, in case this team fails, is to fire this weapon again, even though it will destroy the team underground because quote, an electric shock can stop a heart, it can start it again too. You know, I'm not a doctor. But I'm amazed that with how often the writers of this film probably had to resuscitate each other from various speedball overdoses that none of them ever took an AED class, because that is not how electric shocks work. Also, if you already have a functioning machine that can reach and affect the core that you can apparently operate at will without anyone noticing, why not do that as your plan A? What's it gonna do, stop the core even more? Do that first, then spend trillions of dollars sending these chuckle f**ks on a suicide mission. Fortunately, Hacker Guy keeps the government from firing the weapon, giving the team more time to come up with a new plan C. Now, according to this guy, it took 400 of the world's smartest people to come up with this f**king plan in the first place. Which... No, it didn't. It took a room full of Hollywood writers smashing at their keyboards and railing lines of riddle in between every sentence to come up with this plan in the first place. Anyway, they decide to set up the nukes in a staggered pattern to create a ripple effect, but there's a problem. The ship isn't designed to eject undamaged components from the hull, only damaged ones, and they need to eject the good components in order to place the nukes in a staggered pace, which begs the question of how they plan to set them off in the first place, but hey, clearly that wasn't important. Apparently, the manual override to bypass this is also in a place where whoever goes to trigger it is going to die from the heat. In a conversation that probably mirrors an exact conversation the writers had about this plot point, someone asks why the f*** the override was put out there in the first place, and Brazelton responds that he threw this whole thing together pretty quick and didn't plan that far ahead. Um, movie. Stop pointing out your own plot holes, that's my job. So yeah, Brazelton goes and triggers the override and dies in the process, taking the rest of my interest in this film with him. The nukes are primed, snooty physicist guy gets trapped in one of the nuke pods and explodes, and Josh and Beck are stuck in a derelict ship at the center of the earth with no way of escape. Then suddenly, they have an idea. Apparently, since the hull of the ship transforms heat to energy, they can just solder everything to the f***ing wall, and it'll give them enough juice to power their engines, because f*** making a complete circuit, I guess. Also, I don't know how powerful these engines are, but it's a good thing no one at any point leaned against the wall with a bare hand or something. 
Anyway, they say they only have enough power to run the engines and not their cutting lasers, so they have to escape the core by following lava flows, which are apparently perfectly clear the whole way from the core of the Earth to the ocean floor. It makes me feel like maybe they could have gone down that way, but uh, what do I know? But yeah, Josh and Beck managed to escape, narrowly avoiding being crushed by the fastest tectonic plates to ever exist in the history of ever, and make it to the ocean floor where they're rescued by a dive team. So yeah, that's the core. The gist of it, anyway. I only really scratched the surface of all the silliness that happens in the B-plot, like how radiation from space is making it get so hot that the Golden Gate Bridge itself melts in half, but these people stuck in traffic aren't exploding like hamsters in the microwave. Now, is this a good movie? Uh, yeah, no. Is it worth a watch? Oddly, yes. This is one of those silly movies that I genuinely enjoyed picking apart and mocking because it takes itself so seriously, even though it's written like a first-year film student who had no idea how budgets work massively overestimated their own skill. Personally, I kind of recommend it if you have some buddies that also enjoy watching terrible films specifically for the entertainment value to be found in tearing them apart. It's also kind of a fun little time capsule for the special effects from the early 2000s. They're really not bad, actually, and a lot of them still hold up. You can tell there was a lot of effort put into the sets and into the practical effects, and I really appreciate that kind of work. Long story short, it's a light recommend. The visuals are pretty impressive for when it came out, and the story is completely stupid, over-the-top, and ridiculous, but still fun to watch. And if you found this review fun to watch, don't forget to like, subscribe, and all that good stuff, and I'll see you next time.